Thanks to everyone for letting us know where you're joining us from. My watch says it's four o'clock exactly. So I am going to stop sharing these photographs and we are gonna get underway here. So now that the photos are gone, I hope that you can see our presenter for today. Um, good afternoon and thank you for joining us. I'm Shannon Clifford and I'm the executive director of the Mesa Verde Foundation. I will be moderating today's webinar. Please indulge me as I take just a few couple, just a few minutes to talk a bit about the foundation and our work. As many of you know, the Mesa Verde Foundation is an official philanthropic nonprofit partner to Mesa Verde National Park. As a foundation, we work to secure funding for parks capital improvements, special projects, and of course, to promote understanding of the park and the ancestral Puebloan culture. Our work is made possible by supporters like you. As we approach the end of the year, I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to remind you that you can help us continue our work by making a donation at our website at www.mesaverdefoundation.org. Alpine Bank has graciously agreed to match up to $5,000 in donations made to our year-end giving campaign, which of course means every gift goes further. This year, with your help, the Mesa Verde Foundation accomplished many things, but I'm gonna highlight just a few of them here. First, together with the State Historical Fund, we championed the completion of the pre-production phase and supported the production phase of a new interpretive film to be shown in Chapin Mesa Archaeological Museum. This multi-year project is important to the park, its visitors, and the understanding of ancestral Pueblo and culture. Second, through a partnership with the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation, we are making the various levels of Chapin Mesa Archaeological Museum more accessible through the installation of two wheelchair accessible ramps. These ramps will ensure that hundreds of thousands of visitors to the park each year have access to every part of the museum. Finally, working with park staff, we launched our monthly conversation from the Mesa webinar series. These popular presentations are spreading the word about the park, its importance, its resources, and the treasures it contains. We are thrilled with the su success of this series, which has reached over 1,200 people since its kickoff in March of this year. Thank you to everyone joining today for helping to make this possible. As you can see from our webinar numbers, donations are not the only way you can support our work. You can also help us by spreading the word. You can follow us, the Mesa Verde Foundation, on Facebook and Instagram, and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is where you can find recordings of our past webinars. Now, let's talk about today's webinars. I am delighted to welcome our presenter, Mesa Verde Park Ranger and Bioscience Technician, Andrew Spear. Drew grew up in Asheville, North Carolina and obtained a BS in Geography, GIS, from Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina in 2010. After graduating, he began working in federal land management with the United States Forest Service in Idaho. He later held positions with the National Park Service in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and on a roving U.S. exotic plant management team. Drew arrived at Mesa Verde National Park in 2014 and worked four seasons in vegetation management through 2017. After a brief time in Zion National Park, he returned to Mesa Verde in 2018. Drew now manages the park's physical science program, primarily focused on air quality monitoring, seeps and springs, and the Main Coast River. When he isn't working, he is usually found biking, skiing, boating, hiking, etc. in the Four Corners region. He lives in Main Coast, Colorado with his partner, Jessica. He feels most in his element when backpacking and has completed hikes of the Appalachian Trail and the Arizona Trail. He is incredibly grateful to call Mesa Verde home and will remain in awe of the park's cultural heritage and the wonders found within the landscape forever. During today's presentation, Drew will provide the status and background of water ecosystems in Mesa Verde and highlight some of the research and restoration projects actively occurring in the park. One project supported by grant funding from the Desert Fish Habitat Partnership is to construct wooden restoration structures designed to mimic beaver activity and other natural processes within the National Park System reach of the Main Coast River. 
Drew will also discuss ongoing investigations of historic conditions of seeps and springs and will focus on groundwater movement and springs on Chapin Mesa. Drew has offered to answer questions throughout his presentation. If you would like to ask a question, please type it in the chat and I will relay the questions to Nathan at the end of each presentation topic. For example, if you have a question about springs, type it in the chat box and I will read it when Drew is at the end of the springs portion of his presentation. Drew also likes for webinar guests to interact during his presentation. So there may be a time when he asks questions of you. If you would like to respond to his questions, you can type your answer in the chat and I will read it aloud to Drew. Now, please join me in welcoming Drew Spear. Take it away, Drew. Great, thank you, Shannon. I will share my screen here. Right. Okay, everybody, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Um, it, it's an honor to um, be invited to this webinar series and uh, I'm very excited to share uh, about water ecology of Mesa Verde with you all today. Uh, just kind of a quick uh, overview, let me minimize the screen here. Uh, just kind of a quick overview of uh, the program that I work in here at Mesa Verde. Um, I'm part of the research and resource management group, which can be divided into two different departments, uh, one being cultural resources, where uh, many of our wonderful archaeologists work in, and um, the program I work in is our natural resource program. That can be subdivided into three uh, different fields, uh, primarily focusing on vegetation management, uh, wildlife management, and physical sciences. Uh, I manage our physical science program and I primarily focus on air resources, water resources, paleontology, and geology. I'm not a paleontologist, I'm not a geologist, um, but these are uh, all things that kind of fall in physical sciences and um, that I kind, of, uh, I kind of focus on as well and represent the park in those fields. Um, just kind of an overview of our physical science program, I mentioned air quality monitoring. Uh, national parks are designated as class one air and view sheds, um, meaning, and that's by the Clean Air Act. Uh, basically, national parks are held to the highest standard of air quality um, anywhere in the country. And to ensure that that standard of air quality is being held, um, many national parks have air quality monitoring stations, and they're kind of scattered throughout the country. Um, we have a really long history in Mesa Verde of monitoring air quality and weather. We've been monitoring weather since the 1920s, which is a really large data set. That's um, temperature, precipitation, and snowpack. Uh, we've been monitoring ozone since 1994. Um, we've been monitoring and continue to monitor these things, airborne pollutants and deposition, so pollutants that get deposited in uh, precipitation. And we physically measure visibility, so how far you can see with your, with your eye. And we've been measuring that since 1988. Um, our monitoring station is important to making um, you know, much larger uh, uh, decisions, uh, political decisions, and um, you know, uh, making sure we're complying with the Clean Air Act. This year, we were also um, able to participate in the National Park Service Dragonfly Mercury Project where we collected dragonfly larvae from different water bodies, and they have been sent off for analysis. Um, dragonfly larvae have an ability to store mercury in their tissue, um, bioaccumulation is what it's called, and they also can live for multiple years. So it's a really good way to um, understand how much mercury concentration is in a, in a certain water body. Uh, here's a picture from uh, the 1920s. Uh, this person here is climbing this pole, um, likely to, to check on that wind, wind gauge there at the top. Um, this is a, a still an active weather site, uh, weather monitoring site. And even that rain gauge on the right-hand side um, is, is still the technology used today to measure, um, to measure precipitation uh, on Chapin Mesa. And this site is found uh, in our CCC loop on Chapin Mesa. 
I mentioned the Dragonfly Mercury Project. This is out at Yucca House on a piece of private land that's being donated to Yucca House National Monument, which is a monument that Mesa Verde also manages. Um, here you can see uh, Melissa Trammell in the middle of the pool there um, is, has a net and she's kind of digging around in some aquatic vegetation and hoping to pull out some dragonfly larvae. And here's the dragonfly larvae. Um, we were able to collect 20 samples that are, have been sent off for analysis. And uh, again, this is to understand how much mercury is being accumulated in, in these larvae. And it kind of gives you a representation of how much mercury is in the water body. Um, shifting to water, uh, water is, is a primary focus of, of mine in my position. Um, one of those water sources is um, our seeps and springs. And springs can be easily defined as water that emerges to the surface from the ground. Um, here at Mesa Verde, we have different spring types. We have your kind of classic Mesa Verde seep spring is what um, they're referred to as. We have hill slope springs, which are springs that are found on hill slopes. Um, and we also have two different canyon bottom spring types. Uh, one is a helicrine spring, which is uh, water that emerges from the ground as a wet marshy meadow. And we also have limnocrine springs, which is water that emerges from the ground as pools. We have approximately 270 water sites that have been recorded. Um, and the map on the left reflects that. Um, these are not all spring sites, however. Um, this is kind of a uh, this is, these are sites that are um, our springs, but they're also tanahas or potholes, which is, um, which is a collection of surface water. There's historic wells that are found throughout the landscape um, that were dug out in the 30s to find um, supply water for the park. Uh, there were attempts to, um, many attempts in that time to find a viable water source for, for consumption for visitors and for um, park, you know, park staff to be used. Um, and so there's uh, all of these historic well sites that are uh, kept in these records. There's prehistoric features like prehistoric reservoirs, which um, some of you may be familiar with, um, but basically uh, early water infrastructure that, um, you know, attempts uh, from people who lived on the landscape, ancestral Puebloans uh, to capture surface water. And also uh, the, the points reflect historic springs that have been found in the past, but may no longer be um, supplying water. Um, so the, the first type is, uh, is what we call a seep spring. Uh, you can see in the photo on the left, this is in Long House. Um, seep springs are typically found in the backs of alcoves. And we know that in the backs of alcoves are also where cliff dwellings were built um, because they were protected and shaded um, you know, there it's a, it's a place to be in the heat of summer um, and also gets uh, good, you know, uh, winter sun exposure. Um, but alcoves are formed um, from original processes by water. And so um, it makes sense that seeps are in the backs of alcoves. Um, they're typically long linear features. And in the chart below, you can kind of see a diagram of precipitation um, coming down and um, you know, emerging onto the landscape. You can see water uh, in the, in the, in the right-hand side of the Cliff House sandstone. That's a, a coarse sediment uh, rock type. And so water can travel um, relatively quickly through the sandstone. Um, and so when it rains, the water flows down and emerges or travels through the sandstone. When it hits the layer below that, the Minifee formation, that's a very fine sediment rock type. And so it is, it's a less porous, um, it's a less porous layer. So what happens is when water hits that less porous layer, instead of traveling deeper down into the ground, it, it starts moving laterally. And so that's when we start seeing water emerge where those two um, geologic layers meet because um, the water has freely traveled through the sandstone but it's kind of been caught up in the um, less permeable um, Minifee formation. And again, uh, same thing, we have four geologic layers in the park. Um, same things with the Point Lookout uh, sandstone and the Mancus Shale. Um, this is also at Longhouse and some of you may be familiar. 
Um, these are cupules that were um, scratched out and, and um, developed in prehistoric time when people were, were living in Longhouse. Um, th these, uh, you know, the connection that you can find is of uh, seeing things like this, evidence that, um, you know, there was attempts to capture and collect water. Um, and so these cupules were, were carved out and are all connected by little tiny channels that you might have a hard time seeing in the photograph. But as water emerges from the seep spring, um, water can travel through the channel, collect in a cupule, and when that cupule fills, it then travels along another sketched out or scratched out channel and can fill another cupule and so on. Uh, this is a, again, like I said, seep springs are a very long linear feature. Um, you can see in the bottom of the photo, there is some pooled water there. Um, so, uh, you know, seep springs can have pool, you know, pool type, pool, uh, yeah, pooled water. But in general, it's mostly saturated soil. You can also see it's very green in these areas and some plants really thrive in the wetter environment. Um, this is a helicrine spring, uh, which is a, a spring that emerges from the ground into a wet meadow marsh. Um, these aren't, uh, these are fairly common uh, in the park. This is uh, one, of the, one of the more well-established ones down near the entrance. And this is an area of uh, high um, biodiversity. There's a lot of uh, species that are only found in wetland environments, like cattails and sedges and rushes. Um, so a very um, diverse area. And there is some pooling, but for the most part, this is uh, kind of just a saturated area. This is a limnocrine spring. This is the Spruce Canyon Trail Spring. Um, this is the Kind of the primary pool and this isn't the best photograph but um, and this is also a period kind of deeper in the summer when uh, snow melt occurs in our in in the spring when our springs are um, more productive this pool can be filled much higher but it can also the spring is also a series of pools so there's about four or five different pools um, associated with this spring and the, the, uh, the furthest one, the bottom pool, can actually hold multiple feet of water um, after a, a, you know, a wet winter. Um, I mentioned the wells. This is a, a well, a covered well in Navajo Canyon. Um, and these, these types of features can be found and evidence of, uh, you know, trying to find supply water uh, in the 30s. Um, and so this well, uh, obviously has been damaged um, or the, the roof has been damaged. But when you look down in here, there is still some surface water that can be found inside this um, concrete roofed structure. These are um, tanahas or also called potholes. Um, potholes are not considered springs. They um, aren't charged by groundwater aquifers. They are charged by surface water. And so when we have Typically, they're, they fill during monsoonal events that we have in the summer. So big rain events, big flashy rain events um, will, you know, surface water will travel along the sandstone and kind of channelize and at the low point. And then as the water flows and flashes through, it fills these potholes. And these typically hold water, um, you know, in the monsoon season, if we, if we receive rains in recent years, we we have found, uh, you know, we've had seasons where we don't get a lot of rain during monsoon. Um, but when we have a very productive monsoon season, these can stay full for multiple months. Um, but when they don't get recharged by rains, they, they simply evaporate off. Um, so yeah, the swallow's nest on the left and then um, a very fascinating series of potholes on the right at Little Longhouse, there's no water um, when I took this photograph, but these small potholes are capable of filling. And then obviously, um, if, if you're familiar with uh, the prehistoric reservoirs that can be found on the Mesa Verde landscape, to me, they're remarkable. And I'm just, I'm just always amazed um, when I go and visit these sites. Um, you know, the, the people that lived on this landscape 
were um, you know early developers of water infrastructure, and and that's evident evident by um, you know these reservoirs that can be found on the landscape. So this one uh, at Mug House, which is a, a rock line reservoir um, that holds water. What's fascinating about this, and, and reservoirs are typically filled by um, surface flows. So again, not really a, a spring, but more charged by um, water that travels along the surface. Um, this one to me is fascinating. Um, if you look above this photograph, you can see a little um, notched area where water, um, water above channelizes and kind of all comes together in this notched area. And this reservoir is basically charged by um, a waterfall. So when it rains, a waterfall comes down and fills this reservoir. So why are springs important? Um, they have a, a very significant ecological importance. Um, they're one of the higher biodiversity habitats we have. Um, there are certain plant species that can only be found in spring sites. Um, one of those is maidenhair fern, which is actually only found at one of our spring sites. Um, it's a more common uh, wetland plant found, um, but we only have it in, in one spring site in Fuchs Canyon. Um, the, the plant to the right is Epipactus gigantea, which is a stream orchid. Again, this plant is also only found at one or two spring sites. And there's other riparian veg vegetation, um, rushes and sedges and cattails that are really only found in these wetted areas. Um, also, uh, species that live in spring areas are amphibians. And again, they're also only found in wet areas. Um, and aquatic macroinvertebrates, so bugs that can only um, emerge from standing water. And uh, another importance, obviously, is, is wildlife that travels, um, you know, travels through Mesa Verde. They obviously need water, and spring sites are, can be in remote areas, and, and they're, they can be hard to find. Um, so, um, you know, springs that have surface water that wildlife can consume are, are very important. They also hold a very significant anthropogenic importance. You know, we all know water is essential to human life. Um, and um, but one thing that amazes me is how much water that was needed to um, create mortar to build cliff, cliff dwellings. It's a significant amount of water. And so um, to to create the mortar necessary to build Cliff Palace, for example, um, you know, it's a, it's a very high water need. You know, ancestral Puebloans were building check dams and reservoirs and elaborate systems of channels to kind of channelize surface water. Um, they were clearly thinking about water and it was clearly important to them. And they went great lengths to build, um, you know, build structures that would help um, give them supply water. And dendrochronology records um, show that, you know, when ancestral Puebloans lived on the landscape, that there's some very significant drought periods and much like we're experiencing right now. And so when you look at the condition, the current conditions of springs, um, you have to wonder, you know, if, if they were experiencing similar drought periods that we are now, they were probably very water stressed at times. And um, so again, capturing water in any way possible was was uh, was greatly important. Um, just kind of some uh, species that you can find at some of our springs. This is a tiger salamander that um, is was found at Moorfield Restoration uh, Moorfield Restoration Area. Uh, it's a it's a uh, it's a wetland restoration project that's occurring in Moorfield Canyon. Um, we were actually digging for dragonfly larvae here and pulled out this adult tiger salamander clearly doesn't look too happy, but we did put him back. He's probably safely living in, in the pond we found him. Um, here in Rock Canyon, Rock Canyon has uh, one of our more productive um, spring sites. And here you can find many hundreds of tadpoles. Um, these are tadpoles of red spotted toads. Um, you know, other wildlife utilizing springs. This is at Spruce Treehouse Spring, which is in the back of the alcove in Spruce Canyon. Here's two bats flying in. Um, here's a Townsend's Big Eared At. I, 
big-eared bat. I'm not a bat biologist, but it looks like a Townsend big-eared bat to me. Um, you know, we put out trail cameras for a number of different reasons, and one is to monitor um, water levels and how much water is in springs. Um, this one I accidentally set up on a motion, and so, um, but I was actually pleasantly surprised to find um, that the motion was really helpful in, in understanding what was utilizing the spring water, and these bats were visiting every single night. Numerous bats, not just the three that I showed. Um, and then, you know, many different small mammals and bird species, including this black-headed grosbeak. So some of the springs projects we have going on in Mesa Verde um, that I'm kind of focused on, one is a, a groundwater investigation on Cape. Um, the Mesa Verde Foundation actually helped fund this project, and it's an ongoing project um, to better understand groundwater movement in Chapin Mesa. Um, we, we have been collecting water samples from precipitation and from, um, you know, water emerging at our spring sites. And we're basically analyzing stable isotopes that are found in the water. Um, so for um, the, the two isotopes we're looking at, one is an isotope of oxygen, oxygen 18, and one is deuterium, which is an isotope of hydrogen. So um, don't get too wrapped up in this. Basically, isotopes make up the structure of water. And we can look at how the isotope degrades um, from, you know, from when it starts as precipitation to when it emerges as springs. So if we see that there's a high uh, degradation of the isotope, we know that the water um, has, e has either been traveling in the ground for a longer period of time or a long distance. And we're really hoping that the results from the study can infer the age of, um, you know, water emerging at spring sites. How old is the water um, that's coming out of the springs? Is it five years old? Is it 20 years old? Is it 100 years old? Um, it's, it's not something we, um, like I said, this is an ongoing investigation and um, we hope to have more uh, information about age dating and um, uh, from, this, from this research. And also part of this project is the trail cameras I mentioned. Um, the trail cameras have really allowed us to understand the seasonality of water. You know, when, when are springs um, holding the most water? When are they, um, you know, when are they dry? Um, and how much do they change throughout the year? So more to come on this investigation. Um, it's kind of an a ongoing project that we are continuing to look at. And in the picture on the right, you can see we're, we're capturing drips of water to, um, in the sample bottle to have the isotopes analyzed. Um, the other project with Springs is called a focus condition assessment. Um, we received money from the National Park Service to develop a comprehensive database of all of our water sites. Um, the database is going to support um, data being stored from our ongoing uh, monitoring. So basically every year we, we choose a, a number of Springs to um, perform a, a protocol that we have developed for specifically for um, Mesa Verde Springs. And that's a way for us to um, measure the condition, uh, measure how much water is in the spring, um, understand the vegetation composition, and really just look at um, and evaluate the condition of the spring. And then we can replicate or repeat that protocol um, in the future and understand and, and identify trends in the, in the spring and, and see changes in the spring. Um, what this project also has done has created opportunities to dig a little bit deeper in time and dig through the archives to um, compile, you know, information on what springs were like historically. Um, records are, are kind of hard to find. Um, you know, we have some records from the 80s, um, but old records, you know, what were the conditions of springs in the 30s and 40s? Was there a lot more water on the landscape than we're seeing now? Um, these are all things we're learning um, as we kind of go through old documents and pull out data. So essentially, at the end of all this, we'll have a database that will, that will kind of hold, um, you know, data about water. And we can really, and then we can dive a little deeper into analysis and really understand how have our springs changed over time? And the picture on the right are, is Aaron Murky and Claire Stellick. They're um, interns currently uh, here at Mesa Verde. 
they've been helping a lot with um, inventorying some of our springs and um, remapping uh, a lot of the spring sites um, and super appreciative of them. I believe they're on this call, so shout out to y'all. Um, so what's our current conditions of springs? Well, we have experienced an exceptional drought period for the last two decades. And regionally, um, there has been a drying of, um, of springs and just less water being stored um, in aquifers. And that's emerging from the, you know, to the surface. Um, you know, we've heard, I've heard other land managers in the area that are reporting the same thing. And many springs that um, historically, you know, had water year round are actually now dry. And, you know, we, we read descriptions of them from the 80s. They sound like these, um, you know, beautiful, lush, wet um, springs. And then we go visit them and all, we're, all we find is a dry um, area with lots of salt deposits. Um, so, you know, we, we really feel like the, you know, there's less water on the landscape than there was historically. Um, and obviously drought, it plays a huge factor into that. We, we, I won't get too deep into this, but we also, um, many springs are impacted by trespass livestock. Um, so feral cattle and horses, um, they've, they have a tendency to degrade the water quality, um, trample ve vegetation, riparian vegetation. So vegetation has a really hard time establishing when it, there's heavy trampling. Um, the livestock also um, have a tendency to congregate around these springs and they don't um, move around the landscape too much. So typically they find a water source and they hang out there um, and they live there. And so we do see some springs being overconsumed. So water, you know, water that's emerging is, is very rapidly being consumed. Um, and then we also have found that, um, you know, the, the cattle and horses um, can intimidate the native ungulates that are, that have found, you know, are traveling along the landscape or traveling, um, you know, throughout the park and are looking for water sources. So um, one thing that we're kind of, I've been kind of thinking about more recently is, you know, we're, we're seeing this really big drying trend, but what are ways that we can, um, you know, restore these spring sites? Um, and, and we've gone through an evaluation of restoration strategies. Um, I won't get too deep into this and um, there's no plans right now for restoration, but some of the ideas that we have are, you know, developing these simple rock structures, which um, have been, have shown to be able to hold moisture um, and kind of create um, a more thriving riparian area. And then also um, reestablishing vegetation uh, at some of these spring sites, particularly ones that have been, um, that have seen a lot of vegetation loss or um, disturbance. So shifting out of springs, um, I don't know if anybody had any questions about springs. Um, so we did, into the we did, Andrew, we had one question, but I think that you answered. Um, so this was from Jean and Polly. Apparently some springs in the Southwest are drying up because of climate change. Any evidence of that happening to the springs at Mesa Verde? You did talk about uh, the drought. Uh, do you have more that you wanna say on that? Yeah, so I mean, with climate change, you know, this area is forecasted to be you know, warmer, hotter, and also less precipitation. Um, and obviously that is not uh, not helpful for, for having water on the, you know, in our spring sites. Um, but uh, it's really these drastic events. So, you know, climate change isn't necessarily like we don't get any snowfall, um, but it's, it's more of like sustained drought. So seeing droughts um, that are very, very severe and then also for longer durations um, are really detrimental to spring sites and, and having um, water recharge in them. Um, and then with warmer temperatures, you know, the warmer it is, the more evaporation you're going to see. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd just leave it at that. I think climate change is, is a huge threat to um, our spring ecosystems. Thank you, Andrew. That's all of the questions that we had. Cool. Well, I'll transition uh, now to the Mancus River, which is uh, the other main 
water source that uh, I focus on here at Mesa Verde. Um, and here's a, a lovely picture of the Mangus River. So we call our reach of the Mancos River the Upper Mancos River Canyon. Uh, it's five river miles and it's along the park's eastern boundary. Uh, you can see the inset map in the center at the bottom there. You can see the river traveling uh, on the right on the right hand side of the map and uh, the eastern boundary kind of protruding out Mesa Verde. Um, our boundary is along the Mancos River there and that can be seen in the in the uh, map on the right. Um, and this is a kind of a scaled out uh, map of the watershed as a whole. So in the upper right, um, the headwaters of the Mancos River come out of the La Plata Mountains um, in the San Juan National Forest. The river, um, which is, uh, which headwaters, there's three forks, which all kind of come together in the Mancos Valley that travels through the town of Mancos. And then you can see the river travels uh, the eastern boundary of Mesa Verde National Park. And as the river travels south and west, um, the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe um, has a large, long reach of the Mancos River. Here's another picture of the Mancos River, and I believe this is looking towards uh, Weber Mountain. Um, you know, the uh, one of the the this is a picture of um, a, a nice cottonwood stand, um, some older mature cottonwood trees. Um, you know, the river has a riparian corridor which um, has cottonwood trees and willows. Um, and all of these are, are species that really need, um, you know, accessible groundwater. Um, and so our, our floodplains along the Mancos River um, are hosting these um, riparian shrub and tree species. So what's the condition of the river? Um, well, it's not in the best condition. Uh, <laughs> the river has a very long grazing history um, and that dates back to the 1920s um, all the way through 2005 when the park acquired um, the reach of the Mancos River. Um, uh, grazing has, um, has been found to increase incision, which is more of a downward cutting of the river um, basically creating um, banks that are higher and less accessible for water to um, flow over them. So you're basically creating a more vertical cutting, um, which we call incision. And then the long, you know, the impacts of grazing to riparian vegetation, you know, cottonwoods and willows are, the, are likely the most delicious thing to be consumed. Um, and so they're, they're pretty much targeted uh, first. And when you have a long grazing history like that, um, there has been you know, pretty detrimental impacts to um, you know, our, our riparian vegetation. Um, I would call our reach of the river dewatered. We're downstream from all agricultural pullouts in the Mancos Valley. There's 11,000 plus irrigated acres in the Mancos Valley. And um, all of that gets pulled out before the river travels um, down through the park and down on Ute Mountain Tribe. Um, and then again, going back to climate change, we've, we've really experienced exceptional drought periods, um, particularly in the last two decades, um, almost unprecedented. Um, and um, it's, uh, you know, when we, when we aren't holding a snowpack in the La Plata Mountains, it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't, um, you know, that doesn't help the, the river at all. Um, we, we find that when snowpack um, is below average, that flows, um, you know, flows are either shorter duration of runoff period or just less water coming through. In 2000, the Bircher fire um, had some heavy sediment loading in the river. And there's anecdotal records that fish, the fish population plummeted um, after this fire. And uh, a non-native invasive plant infestation, which actually the park has done a really good job managing, including um, removing almost all tamarisk and Russian olive, which is a huge threat to Western, um, Western rivers. Uh, those were mostly all removed in 2005 and ongoing management of uh, Russian napu. Um, I won't dive too deep into this. This is a hydrograph. We used to have a USGS river gauge 
um, within our reach of the Mingus River. Um, I basically just wanted to show this to show um, how much the river can change. So when you look at 2013, 2014, you know, you're looking at very, very, very low flow um, in the summer. But at times, you know, during monsoon season uh, in particular or, or during runoff, we can get some really high flows that exceed 2000 CFS. Um, these two charts kind of go hand in hand. Um, the one on the left shows uh, the lowest daily mean of flow and the, the annual seven day minimum flow. Um, so basically the low flow um, times of the year. And then the chart on the right shows the Palmer drought severity index. So um, basically showing, uh, you know, when we're in extreme severe uh, moderate drought or when we had, um, you know, periods of moist conditions. Um, so again, in, well, in 2005, the Colorado Division of Wildlife um, assessed our reach of the river and determined that to uh, maintain ecological health, the river in this reach needed 2.3 CFS um, at all times through the months of June through February. And that's indicated by the yellow line on that chart. As you can see, um, you know, a handful of years, we're well below those, that um, minimum, minimum flow and um, particularly in 2013 and 14. And when you look at the drought Palmer or the Palmer drought severity index, those were the periods where we were in extreme drought. And this is what the river looks like, um, you know, in, in our drought conditions. Um, this is obviously um, kind of a sad photograph. This was, is actually the end of flow. Um, <laughs> and the dry up point uh, during um, a very severe drought. Um, if, if anybody remembers and lives in the area, 2017-2018 winter um, had a very horrible snowpack year and that showed um, down in the river where, you know, in this photograph you can see we lost flow um, at beyond this point. And obviously this is also another picture that's um, pretty sad. Um, no water, uh, no water to be seen uh, in the Mancus River here. Um, and this is, this is uh, you know, this doesn't happen every year, but it's becoming uh, more normal. Um, you know, we, and the river should, should be a perennial um, river. Uh, and, and uh, it just isn't. This is this is a, a product of of the dewatering conditions that I that I mentioned. So what's the status of fish? Um, so we have three what are referred to as the three species uh, fish. They're three desert desert fish that are um, associated with one another. Um, they are the round-tailed chub, which has been an endangered species candidate, uh, the flannel mouth sucker, and the bluehead sucker. Um, we did conduct surveys earlier this year within our reach of the river. We did not find any of the native three species fish in uh, Mesa Verde. Um, we only surveyed once this year, and so we really hope that we can survey more um, during different seasons and hope we can find them, um, you know, uh, throughout, you know, at different points throughout the year. But this given survey, uh, we were unable to find them. There was a few of the three species fish found in some of the lower reaches on Ute Mountain Tribe. Um, obviously, not uh, a hap, you know, I'm not happy to report this, but there is a, you know, a, um, a light in this is that, um, or a, a positive is that there was a refuge pool found in Mud Creek, which is a tributary of the Mancus. Uh, this, this refuge pool was found uh, north of the park. And there was hundreds of these species. So we do know that they, um, you know, the three species can be found in the Mancus River, um, but the, the status of them, I, I am sad to report, is, is uh, they are unhealthy. Uh, or we are una we're unable, at least in, in this survey, to, to find the three species of fish. Um, here we are uh, in the Mancus, electroshocking. I'm trying to find the fish. So um, let's talk about beavers. Um, so there's uh, beavers have 
uh, a very long history of trapping um, since the 1600s. Um, and beaver furs were the, one of the most sought after furs in the early 1800s, and it pretty much decimated their population. Um, beavers have been called ecological engineers. Um, it's amazing what beavers are capable of doing. And they're really an important part in the overall, um, you know, river ecology. And what are their benefits? Um, you know, beaver dams can hold water um, on the upstream end. You can see in the photo here is a, a, a fairly large beaver dam. And you can see um, upstream of this beaver dam, you have a really long deep water pool. And the, our three species of fish um, are all known to um, really uh, prefer slow and deep water and um, yeah, slow deep water. Um, beaver can also, uh, beaver dams can also help increase groundwater recharge and which has a benefit to floodplains and um, supporting riparian vegetation that can be found in those uh, floodplains. Basically, when you create a, a deep water pool habitat behind or upstream of the beaver dam, um, you're getting more um, saturation of um, groundwater and groundwater is, is um, becoming higher and more accessible to um, species like cottonwoods. Um, you know, some people uh, blame beavers for, for tree loss. Um, obviously beavers need to eat trees. It's their, you know, um, it's their food source. It's a primary food source. But the way that I think about it is you lose some trees to earn some more. And um, you know the conditions that beavers create are only going to support um, more recruitment of um, cottonwoods and, and willows. Um, beavers, uh, beaver dams help create multi-channel systems and uh, more lateral expansion or horizontal um, movement of water instead of uh, one singular channel, and can help create secondary wetland habitats that amphibians can live in um, and that um, you know, some of our riparian sedges really enjoy. Um, kind of stagnant water that um, can help, you know, amphibians can uh, breed in. So what's the status of beaver in the park? Well, um, beaver have had success building dams uh, in and they are found along the Manx River. Um, in what we've found in the past is that dam, uh, dams are isolated and, and individual, and they're typically uh, they're susceptible to failing during really high flow events. You know, if you get a lot of you, if you get a really um, if you get a really high flow event um, that could cause the dam to to blow out and fail. Um, and so we we a lot of times we see a presence of beaver. But we don't believe that they, we just don't um, see much evidence of them actually occupying the area. Um, but we do have beaver and actually this year has been one of the most pr productive beaver years that um, I've seen here in the park. Um, and this is a trail camera here that's uh, mounted on on one of our beaver dams and you can see two, two beavers here. Uh, kind of an unusual time for them to be out in the daylight. They typically um, are most active at night. Um, but here they are, um, you know, hanging out in these backwaters, which they can find refuge from predators. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, and here they are working on this beaver dam. So a little pop quiz for y'all. Um, if you want to answer the, your answers in the chat um, and uh, There'll be A, B, C, or D answers. So if you um, want to put in your answer in the chat. So the first question is, um, up to how long can a beaver remain underwater for? Is it A, five minutes, B, 10 minutes, C, 15 minutes, or D, 20 minutes? <laughs> Teresa says B and D. <laughs> um, Let's see. Jacob says B. Mike says D. Elizabeth says D. Jessica says B. Joseph says D. Todd says A. That was our first A. Clark says C. 
Nancy says D. Uh, oh, and Teresa says there are two of them, and that's why they have the B and the D. <laughs> they can't agree. <laughs> and then Jean says C. Uh, looks like Drew Arnold says B, and Robin says D. So right. the answer is C, 15 minutes, which um, is amazing to me. Um, and, and, you know, beavers love deep water habitat. Um, it's where they find refuge. And clearly they can remain in water for a significant amount of time. So 15 minutes is, uh, is the answer there. Um, so it so looks like we had two people guess C. So congratulations to them. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the next question is, how many estimated beaver existed in North America prior to the fur trade? Is it A, 5 to 10 million, B, 20 to 25 million, C, 30 to 35 million, or is it D, up to 100 million? Answers are coming in so quickly, I can't keep track. All righty, let's see. I really cannot keep track. People are just... Going in here, so it looks like uh, it looks like Teresa may have started, um, and Teresa is two people, so that they are guessing C and D. Robin is D. Jean and Polly are D. Drew is D. Nancy is C. Uh, Jacob is D. Clark is D. Todd Bacon says A. Uh, Mike says C, Elizabeth says A, Nancy says C, uh, and Joseph says B, and Jessica says D. All right. The answer is D, up to 100 million, which is a lot of beavers. Um, and, you know, in knowing what beavers do to the landscape um, and, and knowing, you know, how, how much they were uh, impacted by the fur trade, you can just imagine how much the landscape changed from when they when there was up to 100 million to um, you know when their population was was decimated. Um, you know, obviously you're taking them away, then you're creating um, you know total landscape changes uh, throughout the country or throughout North America. And the last question: How many estimated beaver currently occupy North America? Is it a 500,000 to 700,000? Is it b 10 million? Is it C, 20 million, or is it D, 30 million? Okay, the answers are pouring in. Okay, so it looks like we have Teresa, and Teresa has a friend joining, so they both think A. Robin says A. Uh, it looks like Jean and Polly say A. Oh my goodness. <laughs> E.M. Marky says A. Drew says A. Lindsay says B. Jessica says B. Joseph says A. Elizabeth says B. Jacob says B. Clark says A. Nancy says A. Uh, <laughs> Todd says he's going to just stick with A throughout. Nancy says A. And Mike says B. All right. Well, the answer is um, up to 10 million. Um, and so when you compare 100 million to 10 million, obviously that's that's 10%. Um, so a, a very significant uh, change in the population um, from, from uh, since the fur trade. Well, thanks everybody. Um, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate y'all participating and, um, and uh, learning about beaver. So I'll continue here with my presentation. Um, like I said, uh, we, we do have beaver activity currently, and this year has been a very productive um, year for beaver. Um, this was a, a beaver dam uh, found last fall. Um, you can see there's all those twigs um, stacked up very, um, you know, randomly. Beavers are very messy, you know, they're, they, they, um, but they're very effective. And you can see um, upstream of that beaver dam, you have this deep um, water pool habitat on the left hand side, um, which is you can't really see in this photograph, but this beaver dam actually did create a side channel. So um, this beaver dam has um, basically allowed um, two different channels to continue downstream. And um, these are uh, 
uh, members of the Mancus Watershed Group, Steve Monroe, who um, lots of lots of shout outs to Steve Monroe, um, super helpful to um, our program and uh, uh, you know all that all that we've worked on with water here in the park. Um, and uh, a BLM partner, Helen Mary Johnson and Jeff Folds, who used to work for the NRCS. Um, here's another picture of that beaver dam. Um, you can see the backwater there. And this is, uh, again, this is last fall, but you can see this long um, deep water habitat of slow moving water. So uh, again, this is last fall and this beaver dam has seen significant changes this year. And this is the size of it now. Um, so obviously they have been very, very active because this beaver dam has a lot more wood than it had in this fall. Um, and so this photo is from June 11th. You can see the duck hanging out there in the pool, probably really enjoying um, you know, having pool habitat to hang out with. Um, and as I scroll through these photos, um, you'll, they're not in sequential order, but you'll see how dynamic beaver dams can be. Um, they can change tremendously um, in short periods of time. Um, here we have a turkey walking across the dam. Here we have a pair of deer. Uh, I believe um, bird nerds, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe this is a cooper sock. Uh, here's a bear, here's a bigger bear. Here's a mountain lion. Uh, my friend who is a wildlife biologist told me this is a female mountain lion. And here's another mountain lion uh, many months later. Um, so, you know, lots of wildlife activity along the river. Um, you know, it's a, it's a corridor for movement and a lot of different wildlife species rely on water being in the river. Um, and they likely favor, you know, these beaver, beaver dam areas. Um, uh, you know, pred there's predators of beavers, um, coyote and, um, um, you know, other, other mammals that prey on beaver, um, but really just having water available for them to drink, which you would think that wouldn't be a problem, but as we've shown, um, you know, that's not, a, it's not always easy to find water in the river. Um, these next series of photos um, really demonstrates um, what happens during um, high flow events and what beaver dams can do um, to, to the river. So here um, you can see uh, a, a rain event is occurring and the river is, is rising. Um, a couple minutes later, the river is, is raging, uh, a, a big flashing event where, where the river is, is um, really increasing in flow. Um, and what, what, what I think this photo really demonstrates well is that if you look up in the top, in the upper right, you can see that the, the pooling, the, up, the up, uh, upstream pooling is really pushing water over the bank. And that's really, um, we call that overbank flows. And that's a really effective way to recharge your groundwater and your floodplains. And, um, and beaver dams are really good at, at creating uh, more overbank flows. So here's the next photo. And now this flow is exceeding over the banks of um, the beaver dam, which is amazing. Um, and this, these three series of photos, I believe is a five minute interval. I can't look at the timestamps because it's being blocked by um, Zoom, but I believe that's about a five minute interval. So you can really see how, how quickly these uh, events can happen. Um, this is a, another um, monsoonal event um, in July. And um, you can see on the bottom in there, that's that side channel um, that I was talking about. And uh, you can see how much flow is coming over the beaver dam and emerging into that side channel. And um, right after that event, you can see beavers um, were probably really happy to have a lot of water um, to, to hang out in, but um, you know, working on mending the beaver dam and uh, maintaining that dam from any damage lost during that high flow. And again, just, uh, just heavy flows and really that, that beaver dam's ability to create overbank flows and really send water laterally 
instead of it being confined into one channel and kind of moving through quickly. Um, this beaver dam is allowing the water to um, move laterally and have water kind of spread out um, across the floodplain. Um, this is a, a, a really cool diagram. Um, I believe this is from the um, Utah State's uh, low-tech PBR, which we'll talk about later, um, uh, field guide. If you start on the left-hand side, um, that's kind of this is kind of representing um, that that incision or down cutting um, in a very confined single channel river. Um, but I, as you can see, two beaver dams were built. And in the second uh, piece here, you can see that those beaver dams have helped create meanders in the river. It's also created different um, features. Instead of having one uniform single channel, now we're looking at having these point bars and different um, hydrologic um, hydrologic scenarios creating eddies or um, you know creating different different types of pools. Um, the third one, obviously beavers are becoming more established and what this has created is a wider river but also multi-channel. You can see that the river is now divided into two channels. And as you go along, you can start to see things clean up. This is um, you know likely a response of, of groundwater in, you know raising groundwater and riparian vegetation um, being able to tap into that groundwater a little bit easier. And in the fourth, in the fourth photo, this is, a, this is a thriving beaver dam complex. And as you can see, there's all kinds of things happening here. There's, there's many habitat types, um, multi-channels. Um, and, and this is, you know, I think it's, it's easy for us to picture a river as a very single channel. Um, but Rivers with, with beaver on the landscape um, should look more like stage four here, where you have multiple beaver dams and water is um, less, less channelized and is now um, spread out throughout the riparian area. Um, and what's the importance of wood? Um, obviously beavers eat wood and they use wood to build beaver dams, but wood accumulating in the river is also a, a super helpful um, you know, super important thing. So having wood piles um, that can naturally um, occur in a river. Um, what, wood, what wood debris piles do um, for fish habitat is it creates a lot more complexity. Um, you can, um, wood, wood debris piles create the scouring of pools. Um, it can create um, low velocity um, spawning zones and wood can also create protection or shade um, for fish species. Um, again, talking more about lateral movement of water, um, wood, water, when water hits these wood piles, it's being forced around. And so it's going from, you know, being a, a very, um, you know, from, from kind of uh, chat, uh, you know, is being pushed off laterally and horizontally um, and kind of around the wood debris pile. Um, and then it can also help encourage uh, overbank flows, as I mentioned, and support floodplains. And really just slowing water velocity um, can really help fish movement. Um, you can see in the diagram below, um, this is kind of an example of what a wood debris pile can do. Water is being forced around the wood pile, and then it's creating different, different habitat types. Um, it's created this eddy behind the wood pile and um, yeah, different erosional processes um, that can be created from simply just having a wood debris pile in the river. So um, I'm gonna talk about a uh, Mancus River Restoration Project um, that we're currently working on. We got a grant award from the Desert Fish Habitat Partnership. Um, and the grant was basically to install low-tech process-based restoration structures. And that's kind of been coined by Utah State University, who's um, done a lot of studying about this certain restoration type. It's a really simple concept. Um, we're basically going to be building wooden structures um, that are built into the channel, and they're designed to mimic beaver, and they're uh, designed to mimic wood, wood accumulation or wood debris piles. Um, they're they're mimicking natural processes, which is um, how could you go wrong with that? You know, 
um, you know, we're, we're not putting concrete in the river, we're not excavating, you know, with, with loaders, we're really just putting wood in the river, um, and, and we're really just mimicking things that, that occur naturally. They're very low tech, um, they're, they're not super fancy, um, you know, they're, they're, uh, and they're also non-invasive, they're, they're not, like I said, we're, we're not really doing a whole lot. We're not putting concrete. We're not, um, you know, excavating um, in these big elaborate projects. Um, and that makes them pretty affordable. You know, all we need is wood and some, and some hands on deck um, to be able to build these structures. So the top structure there is a profile of a beaver dam analog or what we call a beaver simulation structure. And uh, that's, that's the one to mimic uh, beaver dams. Uh, the bottom there is another profile of a, what we call a post-assisted log structure, which is simulating uh, wood accumulation or wood pile. There's multiple goals uh, involved with this project. I apologize, this, this slide is very wordy, but um, you know, our three species fish, they all need deep water pool habitat. They need slow moving, deep runs, and they need habitat complexity, and they need refuge, they need places to find refuge during low flow. And what the current conditions are is when we do lose flow or have very low flow um, periods, we're relying on a pool habitats that just don't currently exist. Um, you know, we have few isolated pools when we lose flow, um, but if we're not getting monsoonal events or rain events, um, you know, the, the river is, is relying, you know, the or particularly fish are relying on these pools to, um, to hold, but they're evaporating. Um, and um, so ideally these structures are gonna create um, and scour out more pools. And so that if we do lose flow, there's gonna be more um, pools for fish to be able to find refuge um, during those really bad um, flow events. Um, the, another goal is groundwater recharge and floodplain connection, which I've talked a little bit about. Um, ultimately, this supports base flows. And um, when you're holding more groundwater in our floodplains, um, there's likely going to be, um, you know, it's going to support uh, base flows in the river. And also support riparian vegetation, um, you know, new, new recruitment of cottonwoods and willows, and also help um, you know, the older cottonwood trees to survive. Um, and we, we really hope this project will be supporting beaver. Um, we're going to be building a complex of structures, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and, and currently, they have an ability to, to build kind of isolated individual dams. Um, we really hope that a complex of structures will kind of support one another so that when we do get a high flow event, it'll hit the first structure and that'll take off some velocity for the second structure, which will take velocity off of the third structure. So as the water moves through this complex, uh, the higher it increases our chance of success because we're taking off some of that velocity that might blow out some of these structures. And ultimately the goal is for it to be self-sustaining so that beavers can occupy, but also maintain what we build and take it over and improve it. And so like if we do have a high flow event, Beavers will be able to come in and, and kind of, um, you know, do repair work or, or rebuild or um, build off of what we created. And it creates a self-sustaining process. Um, and also creating multi-channels and more wetland, uh, wetland areas. Uh, here's a map of our uh, project reach that um, we've put together. Um, these are, we're basically proposing three different types of structures. Um, as I mentioned, two of them, another, the other one is called a SLS, a simple log structure, which is basically just one or two logs that'll be kind of stabilized and help create um, scouring and different types of habitat. But you can see the reach here. Um, this is kind of near our Northern boundary. And um, in the blue there, you can see riparian, kind of the riparian corridor. Um, and these were all kind of placed for different reasons, um, but this kind of gives you a, a layout of, of um, you know, how many we'll build and, and where we're gonna be building these structures. Um, I uh, 
I'm very fortunate to um, have connected with uh, Great Basin National Park, um, who is also working on a similar project um, in Strawberry Creek out at Great Basin. And I was very fortunate enough to be able to visit them uh, this past fall and um, and help you know help them build some of these wooden structures. Um, it's a very different type of river system. Um, you know, the Mancus is, is a much higher flow. Um, this is kind of a, a very low flow um, type of river. And so, um, but these process, you know, these restoration strategies can kind of be applied anywhere. Um, this particular structure is a post-assisted log structure. So to simulate wood accumulation. And you can see the, the posts are pounded in to give the structure some, um, you know, uh, to help kind of uh, keep it in place and um, help take off some of the pressure of, of high flows with um, bigger logs kind of worked in between the posts. Uh, here's another PALS or post assisted log structure. Uh, it's a very similar photo, but um, you can see it's pretty simple, pretty messy, pretty random. And that's kind of how natural processes work. Um, you know, we're not, we're not lining up all these, you know, pieces of wood in some uniform fashion. It's very random. It's very um, dynamic. These are gonna move, these are gonna shift. Some of them might blow out, but you know, this is all part of natural processes and it's all part of this restoration strategy. You know, if these structures blow out, it's not the end of the world. We expect them to fail. Um, and if anything, you know, they blow out and the wood can travel downstream and accumulate elsewhere. So if anything, if we fail, um, you know, if anything, we're putting wood um, in the system. Um, here we are uh, pounding some posts with a hydraulic post pounder, which is a very helpful tool to get um, the posts into the deck. Um, and you can see uh, these three fellows from Great Basin are uh, pounding posts into this uh, BDA. I believe this is a very large post-assisted log structure. And this is a, a beaver dam analog or beaver simulation structure. Um, you can see that, uh, you know, kind of an ununiform uh, layout of, um, you know, bigger logs and smaller twigs. Um, and then kind of packed with mud on the upstream end, kind of give it um, to make it less porous and to kind of um, be able to hold the backwater. And you can see we, we built this uh, maybe in an hour or two. And you can see that almost immediate effects of um, that pool forming upstream of the structure. Um, here's kind of a side view of it. Uh, you can see the randomness of the the wood that has been placed, um, and then that backwater really forming um, upstream from the, the structure. Um, this is the same uh, BDA here. Um, and so that's that's pretty much the, I mean, it's, it's really that simple. Um, these are all wooden structures uh, and they are all designed to, to mimic natural processes. Um, and we really feel like, uh, you know, with, with the conditions that we face, particularly in the summer, this is a really good um, restoration strategy for us. And we really feel like um, it pushes us in the right direction, um, you know, as far as, um, you know, helping support our floodplains and um, really kind of restoring our, our, our restoring the Mancus River or our reach of the Mancus River. Um, we planted a plant project in 2022. Um, it's been heavily supported by multiple agencies, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, U Mountain Tribe, uh, Color, um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Uh, many agencies um, are on board with this project. Um, it's a pilot project. Um, at this time, there, there hasn't been, these structures haven't been built in the Mancus River. Um, there are some projects proposed on private land um, here in the next uh, in the next year, and so this strategy, um, you know, this project is really designed um, for us to learn and to um, understand if this is a, a effective strategy for us and what's going to happen when we build these structures. Um, we're going to be monitoring different characteristics and really understanding. Um, we really want to understand what 
these structures are, are going to do for our river system. Um, and we have a very active um, watershed group in the Mancus River, and I just want to give many shout outs to them. Um, we work collaboratively um, throughout the watershed and um, we're a very engaged group and we're all learning from each other. It's also a time for a lot of action and our, our group is very active right now. There's a lot of projects um, promoting um, healthy ecosystems that are happening. There's some collaborative grant um, proposals that we're working on. And it's just a really um, exciting time for the Mancus River. Um, there's, a, there's just a lot going on and we're all um, learning from each other's projects and really out. Um, and this project is relying heavily on volunteers. Um, I'm just thrilled for um, you know, the interest level of, of people in the community and even people outside the community that wanna learn more about these structures and wanna help us build them. And so I'm really grateful for the, our crew of volunteers that we um, plan on, on having out to build the structures next year. Um, I just wanna, again, thank everybody. Um, I uh, just really appreciate you being here. Um, I'm happy to take any questions that y'all have. Um, even outside this webinar, um, my email is provided here. Please feel free to reach out with any questions. I'm, I'm happy to, to answer any questions if, if you wanna learn more um, about some of the projects we have going on. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Shannon and the foundation. And um, yeah, just appreciate you all being here. So Andrew, before we head out, we do have a couple of questions that came in. Um, I think that you may have answered this one. Are there any efforts to work with others in the watershed to maintain some water in the river? And you just kind of thanked them all on your last slide. Um, and then Mike says, is there a negative effect downstream from the dams, i.e. less water available? Yeah, that's a great question, Mike. Um, and um, uh, it's, it's probably a very lengthy answer, but to keep it simple, um, rarely will there be um, any changes in flow from upstream of the, the Beaver Dam complex to downstream. And what happens is there's this period of saturation so as the water comes through the complex of structures, you know, groundwater is being recharged and there's being water kind of retained um, within, the, within the complex of the river. Um, but once it reaches that saturation point, you're gonna have um, flows come out pretty much the same um, downstream. So um, there is concern, you know, um, with, with water rights holders that, that beaver dams, um, you know, hold water that, that, you know, should be theirs with their water right. There's also, um, you know, a lot of misconceptions about what beaver dams do and that it holds water from downstream. And, and this just, it's just not, um, it's just not really true. Um, there's been a lot of studies about, um, you know, what beaver dams do to downstream impacts and there's, there's really not much of an impact. You know, with saying that um, part of our monitoring is um, looking at flows coming in before our uh, beaver dam complex reach, and then, um, you know, looking at flows um, exiting our complex. And so that's just, uh, you know, a, a way for us to ensure that we're not having any downstream impacts. So th thanks for that question. It looks like we just have one more question. Of course, everyone wants to say thank you, um, and I will get to that in just a second. But Nancy is wondering if there are any plans to introduce beavers into the area where you're building the structures, I'm thinking is what you meant there, Nancy. Yeah, um, yeah, thanks, Nancy. That's a great question. Um, currently, there's no plans to introduce beaver into the area. Um, there have been attempts in the past to uh, introduce beaver. Um, we really hope that the beaver population um, that we currently have in our reach is, um, you know, is we, we feel like, especially after seeing it this year, that that population is, is, um, is on the uptrend. Um, so we really hope that they can, you know, continue to breed and, and um, you know, younglings can go and establish themselves elsewhere and that the population can kind of um, grow and, um, you know, thrive on its own. Uh, there, there are um, cases of introducing beavers and a lot of times um, structures like the beaver dam analogs 
um, can be built specifically for that reason um, to create a, um, a uh, you know, a location where beavers can actually be released. Um, so you can give them a leg up and provide them with a, with a deep water habitat that they really need to, to survive. Um, so you build a really big beaver dam analog and then you can introduce beavers. But currently, um, as far as in the Mancus, there's no plans to um, introduce beavers to the area. Okay, so I'm just gonna read a couple of these. Elizabeth says, fascinating project. Kathy says, great explanations. Teresa That's says, thanks mom. so much. <laughs> That's your mom? <laughs> Is that what you said? Well, yeah. she loved it. Thanks so much, Andrew. Loved the information from Teresa. Todd Bacon says, thank you, Drew. Very informative uh, and well done. Nancy, oh, Nancy asked a question and we already went over that. Uh, Paul says, great job, Drew. Uh, Steve says, great job, Drew. Thanks for all of the good work you are doing. Joseph says, thank you. Great information. Enjoyed the presentation. And Drew says, that was awesome. Thank you. So I'm just going to say a couple of words before we go. Um, I'm back. You can see my face now. I just want to say, Drew, thank you for your insightful presentation. I think we all enjoyed it. Some of the images were incredible. Um, I also want to thank everyone who participated in today's webinar. Uh, I think we all had fun uh, asking questions, but also answering some questions. So I think that was really great. Uh, thank you for doing that. Um, I will be sending a link of the or link to the recording of this webinar to everyone who registered for today's event. In the meantime, if you have any additional questions, you can reach out to Drew by email, as he already said. Um, in closing, I just want to say that we at the Mesa Verity Foundation hope that any holidays you are celebrating in the coming weeks bring you joy and that the new year treats all of you very well. And I will say now, goodbye until next year. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all.